Welcome back, everyone. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, we're rounding out 2022. And as we get to the end of the year, I think it's time to do something that I haven't done for a while. My goals about the future. I've outlined my 2023 goals and four things in particular that I want to accomplish next year. In this video, we'll be going over all of them and why I think these ones are important. Now, we also have a new addition to the passive income portfolio. It's one that's in the finance category. The company's SPGI, which is the S&P Global. Remember in the movie, The Big Short, that scene with the lady with the dark glasses, she worked for S&P Global. And this did not illustrate this company in a good light. Do you think right, we I mean, do giving these loans day. to anybody with a, with a credit score Excuse and a pulse. Excuse me, sir, what do you think we do here all day? I'm not sure, that's why we're here. That's what we're also gonna try to figure out. What does this company do all day? How does it make money? Why am I investing in it? Especially when it's portrayed as such an evil company back in 2007. Now, I also have a bit of research I wanna get into. JP Morgan came out with their research for 2023. This is where they give their outlook and predictions. And in part of this research, they talk about dividends. They call it defend with dividends. And they lay out with a lot of detail and data why they think companies that pay dividends will do especially well next year. And then finally, we have TikTok again. We have a user here explaining his goals for 2023 and how he plans to turn his situation of only having a couple thousand dollars into being a millionaire, a million dollar plus portfolio in one year. It's a pretty ambitious plan, an ambitious goal, and I wanna see how he does it. So as always, we have a lot to jump into in this episode. Let's go ahead and start off with the goals and my portfolio and everything I'm wanting to do in 2023. I've always looked at my channel as basically a window into my finance. This has never been a place to get the hottest stock tips or stocks that would go up 5x or 10x. I've never advertised a channel that way. This has always been a window into what I'm doing with my finances. And I never imagined this YouTube endeavor would grow to this big of a thing. And that's where I want to first start by thanking all of you, all the followers, even the silent ones that just listen for fun and you don't really comment or interact. Thank you as well. I really do appreciate your support. I appreciate every subscriber, even ones that disagree with me from time to time, even ones that leave snarky comments. I really do appreciate all of you. The channel has grown beyond my wildest expectations when I started this. It has over a quarter million subscribers, which is just incredible when you really think about that. And then not to mention, a lot of channels that have a million plus subscribers, Sometimes they get really low engagement, but that's not the case here. We have videos getting 60,000, 40,000, 50,000. Many of them get above 100,000. On average, the channels get anywhere between 700 and 1.3 million views per month on a very consistent basis. So I appreciate everybody that's involved in this. It's been a very interesting, very fun thing to do. And I find it especially interesting to see the channel grow and the engagement grow even when the stock market's going down. We're having a tough year in the equity market, but we're still gaining progress overall on YouTube. The Joseph Carlson Show is growing in subscribers and engagement. And not only that, the secondary channel has now moved to a place where it's getting nearly as many views as my primary channel. It has less subscribers, but that's gone up dramatically this year. We have 68,000 subscribers on Joseph Carlson After Hours. And this channel was started as kind of a side thought, something where I just put in some money into a growth portfolio. I picked more risky stocks that were a little bit outside of my normal investment strategy. And I've been following along with that smaller portfolio and giving my opinion on overall these different tech companies and different related topics. But it's been amazing to see this channel grow as well. It's now at a point where a lot of the videos are getting 30, 40, 50,000 views. This is a substantial amount of views for a channel that has 68,000 subscribers. It's getting almost as many views as subscribers in every video, and every month we're adding thousands of new subscribers. Outside of the YouTube channels, we have the podcast growing, the Joseph Carlson Show audio version. Some of you I know like to listen to the episodes when you're driving and you don't wanna use your data on YouTube. So a lot of you are listening, a lot of you are viewing, but either way, I appreciate you following along. And then finally, with the Patreon membership, I appreciate all of you that are part of the Patreon. And we've seen some incredible growth with this as well. It's actually been incredibly consistent. This is what the membership looks like since starting Patreon. This isn't altered or changed in any way. That's straight off the Patreon dashboard. We've gained members basically every month since the very start of it. And in terms of timeline, that's the point where I quit my job as a full-time programmer to focus entirely on the YouTube and the Patreon. So looking back over the year, I'm very happy with the growth of the channels, with the growth of the Patreon, and with the performance of the portfolio. 
I think things, generally speaking, are moving in a positive direction. I'm not near the point, or even close to the point, like some YouTubers that are making millions of dollars a year. We're a long ways off from that, but we are moving in a positive direction. Now, with that said, I'm not satisfied. I'm not becoming complacent. I think there's a lot more that we can do here. And that's where these goals come into place for 2023. Let's go ahead and start off with goal number one. Number one, I'm going to substantially increase the investment into Qualtrum. Qualtrum is a website, it's qualtrum.com, and it's a suite of tools that's available to Patreon members. This is something where it started off as a little project and it grew into something much bigger over time. Now it has well over 2,500 members using it every single day. It's become quite popular on the Patreon, and I think a lot of members are getting a lot of value out of it. When I started Qualtrum, it was basically an app to take my spreadsheets off of spreadsheets and put them on a website. And then it started to grow from there where I tracked different data with my month over month dividend growth, my year over year growth, my upcoming dividends, my year over year dividend growth, so on and so forth. It did a lot of fun little things with tracking dividends. The next thing that I did with Qualtrum is build something called Insights. Insights is a data analysis tool for stocks where I try to take out all the stuff that I think doesn't matter that much and only leave the data in that's the most important for doing valuations of stocks. The entire idea of this website is to give a 360 view, a full view of the fundamentals of a company by just looking at one page right here. Every single chart you need to see, every single graph, every single piece of data, and most importantly, visually illustrated. That is critical when viewing data. Some people say, I'm a visual learner. I learn things easier when I look at graphs and charts and visuals. That's not you. You're not unique that way. We have studies from Vanderbilt University that people are generally speaking visual learners. That is the easiest way to learn. So when I build Qualtrum, it's with that in mind. Every bit of data is visually illustrated with very easy ways to see progress and see performance over long periods of times of companies. And then you do have additional data to give numbers to those visuals. But overall, that's been a core focus. When I looked at other tools I was using at the time, things like Yahoo Finance, this just doesn't click. When I look at rows of tabular data stacked on top of each other and then trying to decipher what's going on from this, it takes literally 10 times the amount of time when I can have a lot more clarity with a shorter amount of time with Insights. So Insights was a key tool to Qualtrim and the second one that we built. After creating the Insights page, we created the Dip Finder, which is a watch list that shows you the moving averages of your company, if they're currently trading in a dip or if they're surging in price. So that's where Qualtrum is currently, but what I've done is hired more developers and I plan on substantially increasing my investment into Qualtrum because I think I can get a good return on this investment. Right now, I plan on doing this with the price remaining $10 a month, which when I compare to virtually any other Patreon, any other data analytical tool for analyzing stocks, it is far and away one of the cheapest in the market for the data it offers. I'd like to go through all of 2023 without a single price increase. So I'm going to have it remain $10 a month, but I want to have easier onboarding, more intuitive interface. I want to have international support and Canadian support. I want to have more features, a redesign of a lot of different pages, and a better mobile app on Android and iOS. We've hired a mobile developer that's going to be rebuilding it from the ground up. And the hope here is that all of these investments and the amount of money that this is costing will eventually pay off. I'll have high returns on capital employed, so to speak. So I'm going to be building out all of these tools. I'm going to be refining Qualtrim. I'll be making it substantially better than its competitors. And the hope here is that it adds more users, that I'll have an influx of users that will help fund the additional investment here. Now, moving on, we have goal number two, and this is another investment goal. Outside of investing into Qualtrum and hopefully getting a good return on that, the next place where I think I can get a good return is the passive income portfolio. I want to grow it. I really want to push as hard as I can to grow this portfolio as aggressively as I can. So I'm going to be increasing the amount of dollar cost averaging into that portfolio to $2,000 per week. That is my goal. It's more ambitious and it's something that I'm not sure that I'll be able to do, but I think I can. Currently, I have around $70,000 saved in the M1 spend account that should help with that goal. So I have a bit of a runway because $2,000 per week is right around $100,000 for the year. So basically my goal is to dollar cost average in $100,000 in 2023. I have $70,000 saved, that should help out with it. And then that should also increase my dividend income on top of the reinvested dividends. Remember, right now my dividend income is at $7,393 for 2022, and that is up 36%. My goal is to increase this once again 
by over 35%, which is right around a $10,000 a year. So I want to go from $5,000 to $7,400 to $10,000 plus in dividends in 2023. Now, one thing I want to mention on this goal is that obviously $2,000 per week is a ton of money. It's a stretch for me to do this. I'll only be able to accomplish this if things go really well in 2023. So this is a goal that might be altered or pared back if I have unexpected expenses, which oftentimes is the case with something like YouTube that's very unpredictable. But I realized that in all, $100,000 being deposited in a portfolio is a ton of money for a single year. If you're not able to deposit that much money, that's fine. You don't need to. You can build your portfolio at a slower pace and still have an amazing retirement. My parents never once got to the point where they could put this much per week into their portfolio and into their investments, and they still retired in a very good situation. So this is entirely unnecessary. You do not have to build up your portfolio at $1,000 or $2,000 a week. I'll be sacrificing purchasing anything like brand new cars or anything really expensive to try to make this goal happen. Now, moving on to number three, I have another goal regarding investments, but this time it's not about me building Qualtrim or investing more into the passive income portfolio. This one's about my actual investments, the type of things that I'm investing in in the passive income portfolio. Everyone that's been following the channel knows that I've been focused on compounders. I've been on a bit of a kick with compounders. Some people have joked and said when I go to the fast food drive through I order a compounder and cheese. I get the joke. I'm really focused on compounders. And I'm going to relax from this a bit and introduce back higher risk, lower quality companies into the portfolio. All right, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to be introducing lower quality, higher risk companies into the portfolio. Quite the contrary, I'm doing something called high grading the portfolio. That is where you sell off your weaker, higher risk positions and you buy more of your strongest positions that have strengths in different categories. I'm looking for companies that have moats. That's an obvious one, but people use the term moat very loosely. I'm looking for real modes. I want outright monopolies in my portfolio. I know from a consumer perspective and from a civilization standpoint, monopolies aren't looked at positively. Monopolies are looked at as evil companies that own an entire market. From an investment perspective, I don't care. I want to own the companies that have the monopoly. They have such a lock-in on customers that they basically have no one they compete with. If I can't find an outright monopoly, I'll move to the next best thing, which is an oligopoly. Basically a monopoly shared between a couple different companies. These are the type of moats I'm looking for. Companies that have such a stranglehold on a market that they literally have no competition at all. I want companies that have predictability with their earnings and companies that I consider to be undisruptible. They're so locked in with their industry and market position that they cannot be dislodged. Now, when I look at my current holdings, I do have companies that I think meet that categorization. I've described Union Pacific and Canadian Pacific as monopolies many times. I think they're locked in and I think they're virtually undisruptible. I've described Apple as basically having a monopoly. It has one of the widest moats in the market, in my opinion, based off of its huge ecosystem. And I'd say the same for Microsoft. I think this is a very monopolistic company in some ways. It has such a strong market position in so many different aspects of technology that I consider this company to have an incredibly wide moat and to be very difficult to be disrupted. But there are some companies that I do think follow into the weaker category, Target being one of them. I think this company doesn't really have a monopoly on anything. It's just another retailer. It's a great one and I've made money with the stock, but I don't think this company is monopolistic at all. Church and Dwight sells mostly secondary products. It's a great company, but I don't consider this company monopolistic at all. So part of high grading a portfolio is making judgment calls. It means that you're selling off these weaker, less monopolistic, less predictable parts of the portfolio and moving that money to the stronger, more resilient, more moody parts of the portfolio. And that's gonna be a big focus of 2023. Overall strengthening the portfolio to the point where I think every single holding in it is incredibly strong. And I'll let you know about different changes I make with the portfolio as we go along this year. I'll be showing every single thing I'm doing with transparency like I have from the start. Now, finally, moving on to number four, my final goal of 2023 is to improve the content quality. And this is something I try to do basically every year. I want to remain with the core aspects of the Joseph Carlson show, which I think is centered around being honest and transparent with everything that I'm doing. But I also want to make some different improvements. 
I want to improve the technical setup. Improving the technical setup literally means I just buy better tools to be able to create the production of this show. Last year, the quality of the videos on the After Hours channel, for example, looked like this. And then this year, I upgraded the camera quality, I changed the framing a little bit, I added in new editing, and I think overall it makes for a better production. This is a technical improvement to the show over time, and something that I plan on continuing to do into 2023. And outside of improving the tech setup to produce the show, I also plan on increasing the ways to view and follow the show. I've been putting more content onto Twitter. I've been creating more content on the secondary channel, and I've been putting more content more frequently on the podcast version, trying to give followers more ways to follow along with the journey at your convenience. And I also have a goal to increase the actual quality of the content that's being produced, both in terms of editing and the data and insights that's being shared. Early on in the channel, I had a strong focus on looking at the qualitative parts of a company, the leadership, the mode of the company, the intangible assets, the business model, the way the company would try to outplay and outdo its competitors. This is the story of a stock. This is the qualitative analysis, the things that the numbers don't tell you. Then later on in the channel, I started to emphasize more the quantitative aspects of a company, the valuation, the pricing, the free cash flow yield, the revenue growth, the EBITDA growth, the free cash flow, the free cash flow subtracting out stock-based compensation, and so on and so forth. This isn't the qualitative aspect of a company. This is the quantitative aspect of a company. This is the fundamentals. And what I want to do in 2023 is combine both the quantitative data, the things that we can calculate, as well as the qualities of a company, the intangible aspects, and I want to combine them into one rich, full investment thesis on a company so that you have both an understanding of all of the fundamentals and the qualities of a company. And I think I can accomplish this. I plan to step up my level of research and analysis on these companies and really try to portray the full story of a company, both the data and the qualities in a full, well-rounded analysis. So that's really it. That's my four goals for 2023. And I think these are ones that I can do, but sometimes things unravel in a way that we don't predict. So even though these are goals, they're not guarantees, but this is what I'm hoping to accomplish next year. So we have a lot we're going to be doing in 2023. It's going to be a busy year, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun going through it together. Now, having said that, I want to jump in to the new addition to the portfolio, which is SPGI. I put it in the financial category because this is a financial service company, but it's not necessarily like T. Rowe Price, where it's just a money manager, and it's not a bank like J.P. Morgan Chase. The S&P Global is known to be one of the big three credit rating agencies. They're known as the big three because there's just three of them and they're all really big. This is what a monopoly is. It's what an oligopoly is. It's when a couple companies control a huge market and they have a position where it's nearly impossible to disrupt them from that position. The big three in this case are S&P Global, which is the one I'm buying into, Moody's, which is the one Warren Buffett has owned for decade after decade, calling the company basically bulletproof, and then Fitch Group. Now, the thing a lot of investors don't realize because we don't really have a close connection with this company, we're not really using it personally, is how powerful of a position they really have. Buffett has repeatedly talked about Moody's Corporation as having these qualities that are very attractive to investors. We pay Moody's a lot of money to rate us, you know, <laughs> I'd like to not pay them that money. So I've seen their position, the competitive position, and, you know, they operate in a business uh, uh, with very wide profit margins, very high returns on capital, and it's a business that will probably grow over time. Is it a conflict of interest that you pay them to rate you? Well, I, I wish it were so that we didn't have to pay them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, as a practical matter, you know, uh, we need their rating. We shouldn't need their rating. I mean, anybody should be able to look at Berkshire Hathaway and say it's a wonderful credit. But the world, in the way the world exists, we need their rating and we need Standard & Poor's rating. And we are not in a position to negotiate on price. And I hate to say that on national television where the guy listening may be the guy that determines my bill next time. But that is the position we're in. We live in a world where we need their rating. They have to have it. And they're not in a position to negotiate on price. Now, even though the credit rating agency is a very big moat market and it's a nice one to control, it is very cyclical. And that is something that I've said many times I don't like. I don't love highly cyclical companies. And we can see what's happening right now. As a lot of companies are preparing for recessions, you can see that they're issuing less debt. They don't like to issue debt if we're going into a slowing economy. So we can even see with companies like Moody's, the amount of free cash flow every quarter for the past year has been going down. Because remember, these companies make money by rating debt. 
they rate the bonds. And if there's not as many bonds issued, they don't make as much money. So the amount of earnings per share has also gone down 30 or 40% year over year because there's less bonds being issued now than there was a year ago. In this time period, in excitement and cheap debt, there was bonds being issued left and right. Companies were taking out record amounts of debt. So Moody's and S&P Global were benefiting greatly from all that debt being issued. And when we flip over to S&P Global, we can see the very same thing here. Earnings per share are dropping because the amount of bonds being issued is going down. And that's a problem with these companies, something that I don't like, but what I do like to see is this company actually addressing this problem with their stock and their company. See, what S&P Global has done over time is diversified their revenue stream to try to make it a less cyclical company. Since 2021, the ratings portion of the business made up 49% of the income. So roughly half comes from ratings. But then we have 27% coming from their market intelligence applications. We have 11% coming from Platts. That's like market indicators and things that a lot of traders and big banks use. And then we have the indices. They control things like the S&P Global and they get kind of a franchise fee from anybody that makes ETFs based off of their indexes. So they also get residual income from their indices and the growing passive income trend has benefited them. So what we see here is a level of diversification. Even though part of their business is highly cyclical, this part of the business is far less cyclical. And still they're using this additional income to smooth out the revenue and the free cash flow over time. Now S&P Global has even done more to try to diversify their income and make their business set up for more future growth. They don't wanna be hampered down by just the credit rating portion of their business. They wanna have stronger secular trends. And so they purchased a company called IHS Market, which is a market data company providing data that everyone needs to invest in the market, do research, build ETFs, all of that type of stuff. There is a ton of data this company owns. Now the effects of this merger will even diversify their income more, where now the ratings make up roughly 30% of their revenue, going down from 50%. And then the financial info and services make up 32%. And this is a good business to be in. Everything that they purchased with this acquisition is almost entirely reoccurring revenue. So the company they purchased is all data-driven subscription-based revenue with very high margins. They have 14% going to transportation and energy, 15% going to commodity and energy, and then 9% going to the indices. So when I look over this transaction of S&P Global buying IHS market, I really like it. I think this is a good decision for management. It is true that the largest moat part of their company, the ratings part, is becoming a smaller portion of the company but they're sacrificing a little bit of moat to make it so that they have way more secular growth trends. And the thing that they're buying is still pretty wide moat. Financial info and services is a very good market to be in with high margins and reoccurring revenue. And it has strong secular trends. There's going to be a far bigger need for these financial info and services in the future than there is right now. So I think management is setting the company up very well for the next decade of growth. I view this type of transaction as similar to Google, not just relying on their core search engine, but trying to grow on things like cloud, things like YouTube, and other bets. It's a way of a company that has an incredibly wide moat with one part of their business, using that moat to buy other growth paths for the company. And in this case, every single aspect of this company that it competes in does have strong secular growth trends. Ratings has revenue growth over the past five years. Their market intelligence division has revenue growth over the past five years. Market indicators has revenue growth through both pricing power and expansion of customers. And not only are they growing the top line revenue with every individual division, but they're growing their operating profits. Every single division is. They're growing their operating margins. Their margins are either consistent or slightly growing over time. So this company here is service-based, reoccurring revenue, high margins, with growing revenues throughout every part of the company, growing operating profits, and growing margins. It's very difficult to find something so far at this company that I really don't like. And then not to mention, the first thing that they actually go through in their earnings report, the very first thing is their free cash flow. I look at a lot of earnings reports and I don't see many companies that wanna highlight their free cash flow right up front. But this company is so focused on growing, 
real free cash flows, undiluted free cash flows, that they put it front and center. This is page eight of the investor relations. This is at the very beginning of their 100 page report because they're proud of the growth they've had in free cash flows. So when I look at Qualtrum, we can see their very same free cash flows there. Massive free cash flow growth over the past five years and very consistent before that for literally two decades. So this company is a first and foremost free cash flow focused company, but they also focus on returning capital to shareholders. That's something they highlight right up front. They're focused on resulting in strong total shareholder returns. And that is something that they have successfully done. The irony with S&P Global is the company benefits from people moving to passive investing, buying the S&P 500. They're the company that's basically selling you the S&P 500, selling you passive investing. But had you invested in S&P Global instead of the passive investing ETFs, you would have done far better buying the company, creating the passive investing than buying the passive investing itself. S&P Global's returns without dividends is 522% over the past decade. And they are a big dividend payer. In fact, this is one of the most well-respected dividend payers because of their long history. In 2023, they're going to become a dividend aristocrat if they do one more dividend raise, which they will. That'll make it so that they have 50 consecutive years of dividend raises. And in the past five years, they've averaged dividend raises, not at this puny one cent raise every year, like companies trying to just hang on to some record and they're doing it as a symbolic raise. They've averaged 15.7% dividend raises for the past five years. I only have a couple other companies in my portfolio that have raised dividends that fast. So this should be one of the faster dividend increasing companies in my entire portfolio. Now, of course, the fundamentals of this company scream that it's a compounder in basically every aspect, growing net income over time, growing earnings per share over time, very consistent and growing free cash flow that's exploded recently. I think this will become even more consistent with their their latest acquisition. If we look at the balance sheet of the company, they've taken on a lot of debt. It's nearly tripled, but that is for this new purchase. And they've committed to paying this debt down aggressively. And you can see that they're already doing that. Their debt for the acquisition went up to 11.33 billion, down to 10.78 down to 10.73. Every quarter, they're slashing away more of their long-term debt. And likewise, they also funded this acquisition in part by shares outstanding. You can see that they issued a lot of new shares to pay for this new company, but what are they doing? Right away, they're aggressively buying back the shares they just issued with their new income stream. 338 million shares outstanding. One quarter later, it's 329 million. That is a huge share reduction right after an acquisition. And this company says that they're doing an accelerated, aggressive repurchasing of shares. They want to get this dilution back under control as fast as possible. And of course, we can look at that defining metric of a high quality company, returns on capital employed. We have a company here that consistently has above 30% often getting up into the 40% returns on capital employed. That is top tier. That's getting up with companies like Estee Lauder. This is the Terry Smith metric, the number one where he defines a good company from a bad one. And in terms of valuation, it's hard to do valuations right now without the full impact of their acquisition, but the company has de-risked a lot in terms of valuation. It's come down in price 26% this year, so it's had a substantial drop as investors are a little bit concerned about the slowing economy and the slowing credit rating agency business. But like I said before, that's gonna make up a smaller portion of their overall company. And I think the secular trends of this company will outweigh any short-term problems. So right now, I'm looking at it as an opportunity to buy in at less inflated prices. Buying it over here, I think is a mistake. You're just getting a very frothy company, high prices, but it's de-risked a lot coming down into this zone. Maybe this company will go lower over the next year, but that's fine. For me, this is a multi-year holding, which I plan on dollar cost averaging in over 2023. So I'm not saying you should buy this company, but for me, this is exactly what I'm looking for. A wide moat service-based company with secular growth trends, high amounts of consistent free cash flow, and a company that doesn't dilute the shareholders through massive amounts of stock-based compensation. And a company that also pays a growing dividend and has done that for 49 years. It checks all the boxes, 
I'm happy to have it in the portfolio. Now, moving on, I was reading through a lot of different investment outlook write-ups from different companies and banks like Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. And I was reading through JP Morgan's investment outlook for 2023 and something caught my attention. JP Morgan has an entire section here called Defend with Dividends. They say that our base case sees a moderate recession in most major developed economies in 2023. That's pretty consistent with the consensus. They say that we believe that the equity markets have already priced in a lot of the bad news in 2022, but stocks which provide an attractive income appear more reasonably valued than those with little or no income. Investors who are more cautious than us about the outlook may want to focus on this cheaper segment of the market to hopefully limit further downside. Of course, the income stream from dependable dividend payers can also help buffer returns. Strong dividend paying companies often go to great lengths to maintain dividends, even when the earnings are under pressure. With payout ratios relatively modest at present, maintaining current dividends looks more feasible than in some prior recessions. So what they're saying there is right now, companies have a lot of leeway. They have a lot of flexibility with their dividends because of the low payout ratio. For example, a company like S&P Global has a payout ratio of 27%. They have a lot of flexibility. They could raise that to double and still be able to safely cover their dividend. Now next, JP Morgan goes on to highlight a point that I've been making over and over again. So JP Morgan's late to the game here, but they're pointing out something that I really think is important. Dividends are far more consistent and reliable a reliable form of returns in the stock market than any other form of return. Dividends tend to fall less than earnings in recessions. So on this chart, there's two different graphs here, two different colors. The blue is the EPS drawdown in different companies, and the orange is the amount of dividends being paid. Notice that the blue line, the amount of earnings of companies, goes up and down way more dramatically and volatile than the amount of dividends being paid. This is because dividend companies are not only more resilient, more full weather proof, they're more recession resistant, but they also give a strong priority to continually paying the dividend even during difficult times. Unless they really think it's a long-term problem, they will continue to pay the dividend. Now they say in conclusion, even though we expect a challenging macroeconomic environment in 2023 and downward corporate earnings revisions, we think income stocks could have a good year with dividends proving more resilient than earnings. For investors that are tentatively Looking to increase their equity exposure, an income tilt could prove relatively resilient in the worst case scenario, while also providing the potential for outperformance in a more optimistic scenario for markets given the attractive valuations. So they see both upside with dividend payers if things go south next year and if things go well because of valuations. In both cases, they're suggesting a tilt towards income stocks. Now enough about my plans and my ambitions. I want to hear the input and plans of someone else, this individual here, who highlights his plan of how to break out of the situation he's in. He's working at a gas station and by the end of 2023, he wants to have a million dollar portfolio and he lays out in just a minute 30 here how he plans on accomplishing that. Let's go ahead and jump right in. This is my step-by-step -step plan on how I'm going to get rich from working at my gas station job. So first, let's break down my expenses. I spend $1,500 a month on rent. The first thing I want to do is pause right there and just say, I feel bad for people in this situation. Paying $1,500 for rent is crazy. I pay less for my entire home mortgage. I bought a home back in 2017. I paid a lot down to get the payment down. And it's actually a lesser mortgage than his entire rent payment. So I feel bad for people having that much of their income eaten away by rent payments. That's, that's crazy. I spend $100 a month on electricity. I spend like $30 a month on Wi-Fi and another 30 for cellular data. And then food, I spend like $30 a day. So that's $900 a month. And so that brings us to a total of what? 2560 And I also got like insurance and Hulu. So I'm gonna add another $200 just to be accurate. So 2,760 bucks. $2,760 for a single person. It sounds like it's just him. It's a lot of money. I think that's normal if you have like a family, but that seems like a lot for just one person. That's every month, so that's a lot of money. Right now I'm working 40 hours a week at this job and I'd get paid 11.50 an hour, so that brings us to $460 a week, which is 1800 a month. So even if I'm working 40 hours a week, I'm still gonna be losing like $920 a month. Yikes, so the first thing I'm gonna do is stop spending $30 a day on food and cut that down to 10. And if I do that, then I'm only losing like 300 bucks a month. This is crazy to me. 
He's working 40 hours at a job that doesn't even afford what he's currently paying in all of his expenses. He's cutting down on his food budget, which I think is good, but I think that housing cost is a lot. I'd be looking for anywhere cheaper to live if I was him. Cancel my Mint Mobile cellular and I stop using Netflix and Hulu and all that shit. I think I can get to the point where I can live just off of this job. So I'm gonna do that. So that brings us to net zero, but I'm still making $40 a day from crypto mining. So that's $1,200 a month. So I'm gonna get another job for 30 hours a week that pays at least $15 an hour. And off that, that brings me up to 800 plus the 1200 from crypto mining. That brings me up to $3,000 a month. And I'm a DoorDash and Shovel Snow too, so I'll probably be making about $3,500 a month. So he's working 40 hours per week at one job, 30 hours a week at another job, and then doing DoorDash on top of that and shoveling snow? If that's true, I have to give him credit. That is, that is hustling. If I take all that money invested, I think I can get at least 100 k by the end of 2023. All right, so he wants to save at least $100,000 by the end of 2023, which I think is something he could do. If he really does cut down on his expenses and works basically all day, every day, he can save up $100,000. I've seen people do that. I've seen people write on DoorDash forums how they're they're making an extra thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year just on that side gig. So I think he could accomplish this. But how does he get to the million dollars? He says he wants to get that to a million dollars. And I'll take that 100K, invest into a stock that'll 10X, and then I'll be a millionaire. Boom. Easy. So that answers it. He's going to take the $100,000 that he worked all year for, invest it in a stock that will 10X easy. And then he's a millionaire. Just a, a simple 10X, which I think is the most simple step to any investment strategy. You save up the money, uh, you work really hard for one year, and then you just simply 10X it you get your million dollars and you're, you're done. You've saved up enough for life. Now, I genuinely wish him the best and hope that he does find a stock that 10X is because of how much work, how much actual work he's putting into this. But this just makes me so nervous to think of. Someone working all year around the clock and then putting all of their savings into a single stock in and of itself is extremely risky. The amount of concentration that has, the amount of risk implied in it, not something that I would do. I think there's a better path. But best of luck. Hopefully you find a good stock. That's all for now. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to share your goals with me as well, leave them in the comments below. I will read over them. Having said that, I'll see you in the next episode.